Dynamics User Group uh, presented through the webinar. Um, ben, did we? Yep, someone's hit the recording button for us. Um, so please be aware we are recording. Um, starting with the usuals. So an acknowledgement of the country. We wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, the Wurundjeri people of the Noongar Nation and pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land, as well as acknowledge the contribution they make to the life of this city and region. So just the usual, uh, please be aware of where your toilets are. Um, and if you need to evacuate, you need to know where to go. Um, timings, we'll try and do our best to, to keep to the timings and give everyone a good lunch hour. <laughs> uh, so today, um, we're going to be having an extend your D365 FNO solution with Power Apps. Uh, we do have a short one tip um, and by Karthik, and then we'll be going into the customer showcase from uh, Western Power. And then a couple of announcements from Peter. So jumping straight in, Natalia, are you on the, the line? Yeah, I'm here. Um, thanks. I'm just going to share my screen uh, and let me know when you can see it. You should see FNO screen for now. And in yep, a second, you should see PowerPoint presentation. Yes. OK, perfect. So hello and welcome to the today's session about how to extend your Microsoft Dynamics 365 FNO solution with Power Apps. My name is Natalia and I am solution architect working from Fusion 5 New Zealand. I work with FNO and Dynamics IX uh, since version 2009, primarily focusing on supply chain and manufacturing modules. So today's session is um, basically about one of the topics I'm currently passionate about, how we can use Power Apps in our FNO implementations and extend that. So I'm going to give you a quick overview, and then we can jump into the examples I've prepared for you. So basically for the previous implementations with Dynamics IX, with the older versions, we, um, when we were assessing the solutions, I'd probably say, and we found the gap between customer requirements and um, the um, standard uh, standard system, uh, we didn't have any other options except doing a customization with finance and operations, uh, considering and continuous updates. We have to be mindful about modifications we do. Therefore, we should assess any other ways of doing modif uh, doing the, let's say, fill in our gaps. And sometimes one of the solutions for us could be a power app. So what is power app really? It's a suite of apps or services, connectors and data platform that provides a rapid application development environment to build custom apps for your business needs. With Power Apps, we are able to create no code or low code solutions with uh, rich business logic combining multiple services or work focus capabilities to transform manual business processes to automated. Power App, together with Microsoft Flow, Power BI, and Common Dot Service, is a part of Power, Power Platform, which works together with Dynamics 365 products. When we talk about Power Apps with FNO wide, I probably can highlight two different types of apps we can do is um, create is embedded Power App, the app that can be open from your finance and operations solution that the app could show some additional data from third party services and so on. The standalone app can be opened on your mobile device. It can be a laptop or phone or tablet which doesn't actually have supposed to have like a link or you don't actually use the finance and operation directly uh, and it's more focused to simplify data entry or and replacing the complex screen for your business processes so i will share with you today two examples uh, for each of apps uh, what each of app types and the first one would be a product label printing app and i will jump to the fno instance to provide you a demo of it before we'll have a look on how it was actually designed and what are the core, core components sitting behind it. So everyone can see FNO screen, is that right? Yes. Yep. OK, yep. perfect, okay. thanks. OK, so I'm in uh, Microsoft Dynamics Finance Operations on the main page. So what we're actually going to do is 
we have created an app that generates the product label. So this app can be opened and navigated from the release product screen. So which I'm going to do now, I will open this up by selecting the record like any product record like two. So we have here a power app icon and underneath of that you could see product label menu item. So this is how we actually hooked in our app to our FNO instance. So I'll click on that just to show you how that looks like. So what happens and what you see is when the app opens is actually picks up the um, the selected record uh, from um, the system. So what it does is it populates the item name and this particular uh, item doesn't have current origin, but what happens behind the scenes is that it retrieves the data from FNO. There is a limitation on the amount of data you can pass to the Power App. So what happens is that we can, from FNO perspective, we can pass only one field. So what we do is we pass in uh, item number into the app and then by triggering Microsoft Flow, we are extracting other remaining information from the product by using standard data entity for products. On the bottom, you see the app design. So uh, what happens is that we have a predefined label layout, which can be found under layout button. So we are using a ZPL language, uh, which is standard Zebra programming language for labels with the defined placeholders. So what we do is on the fly, we are replacing these placeholders with the values from the selected product record. And we pass those details to the third party service web service to bring us back or return us an image of the actual label, which we're going to do. We have also uh, like we have two other functions here, which is we can open the label as a PDF so you can print it from the uh, from the web browser. And another one by going back is uh, the printing. So there is, let's say, a non limitation that there is no capabilities at that stage from Power Apps to do any printing. So all the printing can happen only through the web browser capabilities. What we have done is considering that our app is built uh, on based like on the FNO, we are actually exposing uh, all data action and using standard approach. Uh, with document routing agent to print the label. So basically what we are doing is um, triggering um, Microsoft Flow by passing the same the label layout as well as the printer details. This particular design, let's say of this label, it doesn't have um, option to select the printer. Uh, it's you're not limited to that. You can actually edit. It was just done for simplicity and the all the printer details are actually at that stage specified in the Microsoft Flow. So look into the app itself. So if I'll go to the um, Power App environment, I'd probably say this is my app designer. And on the um, left hand side, you can see the screens I have the app has. So this is the main screen and the parameter screen is really the label layout design. The main, um, let's say app itself, as you see on the start event, what we do is retrieving the data from FNO and at the same time we are triggering flow by passing back and requesting the item ID. Well, basically we're passing back to our flow item ID and our flow will return us under this variable after us other flow values. It will return us some information and going back to the main screen. If I'll click on any of the fields like the item and origin, so you see how we are retrieving or getting item name or origin from the information that are passed us to back to us through the flow. Same thing and same story with the printing. So we have a flow that we trigger. We pass it through the label layout. The label layout is actually layout I showed you before, so it will already have some variables embedded into it, so it actually passes the real label content, probably say so. By clicking on the product image, you would see on the top that we have a property image set up with the API that we are calling and doing the same thing similar to the printing. We are passing our label design into it. And these are the parameters that are basically specified in this API that we'd have to pass. Looking at the flow itself, um, that's going to be. So these are two flows we have. So the first one is get record. So this is really the uh, 
pass in the details or getting what we have, what we are setting up in the flow is I'll probably going to open designer. That would be easier. OK. So we're triggering that from the Power App. We specify our instance, specifying the data entity from FNO perspective. We're defining the legal entity from where it can be run and passing the variable, which we basically get in from the Power App. And in our response, we are providing back and fill in the fields from the values returns on the previous step. So this is what um, Dynamics X bring us back. From the um, printing perspective, so we have an execute action and that would be similar. So basically what happens is that we have a power app, we have a data entity, oh sorry, um, O data action exposed. So this particular one, because I didn't have printer set up, this one at that stage has nothing, but what basically happens is that, oh sorry, we should pass the label as a label layout. So our action has two parameters. One is the printer name, the second is the label name. And still we're specifying the instance and hooking in our action. So let's say what's the minimum uh, customization or modifications because we're using standard or data um, uh, or data entity for product and to retrieve product details. And uh, we have uh, exposed one data or data action to do the printing, we've created a reliable solution for us for the product label print. Of course, it's designed more for not like ad hoc labels, but something which could be performed on requests. So you basically, um, yeah, so you basically by, by doing this particular change uh, with, with this particular app, where you could set fulfill some requirements from uh, well, your business requirements, just the print in the label. So basically simple as and could be called from any form. So the logic or you're not limited to the logic or the app prettiness itself. So you can actually enhance and make it much more better and can add more and more functions into it. So you have no limitations I'd probably say at that stage. So this is the first one. Um, We've you, we've done a couple of others um, which I'm not going to demonstrate, but it, it, other examples of the app could be a couple of Microsoft demos actually that they build an app that provides you a tracking ID uh, for your sales order. So basically they also hook in the uh, 3PL service that accepts the tracking number and shows you where your parcel is. Uh, one of us we did one of the apps we did for our customers, which shows you the image from the PowerPoint. It's like a drawing when you do the manufacturing order. You have an embedded screen actually with the product drawing. So same thing, simple as with no modifications at that stage. So that was the first one. The second app, I'm gonna go back to uh, the slides because this one will be more. It's not embedded, so you actually have to have your um, so, um uh, the device I, I didn't I didn't run this on my device so just to recap uh, for the first solution what are the core components we had is uh, finance and operations as a data source to get data from it power app is for user interaction displaying label uh, displaying the label printing the label maybe doing some changes because fields are editable you actually could put any extra details on the label itself or pass it to your label as well the power automate to retrieve the data from FNO and to pass the data to the printer and then the three-party service which is our API which actually prints or oh, sorry the displays the label returns us the pretty image with the label how it looks like so the second example is a standalone power app so I didn't actually have let's say my device set up to share a screen so what it basically does is we've created an app to upload product image to the FNO. So it's a standalone app, can be run on your device. Uh, it, uh, it extracts or has uh, uses FNO as a data connector. So once you open the app, as you see on the right hand side, it actually brings you back the list of all products with the icon against it to take a photo. Then the user can take a photo put some comments on it, and by saving this information, the data is actually being pushed to FNO. So this is probably, at that stage, this one was done completely out of the box. We are still triggering standard uh, da da document handling attachment um, entity to create and push the uh, data into it. So the Power App itself, uh, 
when it opens, it gets the data of all the information about all the products. Uh, then we pass to it the image we have, and that's basically all. Uh, with the core components, probably similar to the previous step, we use the FNO as a data source, uh, retrieving the data about our product details, the Power App to take a photo, select the products, how many user interactions, simple action, and the Power Automate to push the data to finance an operation to actually save our image into it. So once again, second solution, this was done completely out of the box. However, similar requirements could be used. You know, there are some businesses which want to take a photo when you do quality inspection, push it somewhere, save it to SharePoint or attach it to the record in the system anywhere else. This is, can be simply achieved. And as I mentioned before, it's no code or low code. It's uh, really um, about whether we have a data entity or action that needs to be triggered and just exposing it for us being able to hook in and use it in our solutions. Therefore, you don't actually need to modify the system now. You don't need to build some other, let's say, um, more expensive or other solutions. You can simply fill in your gaps with those minor changes, I guess. That's me. That's all. Um, any questions? Thanks. Thanks, Rabbi. Um, this is uh, Sriram from um, uh, Rada, Earth. Uh, this was really good. Thanks for taking us through. Um, I've, I've seen I know, blogs as well, <laughs> blog posts as well. Um, I've got a couple of questions, uh, if I may ask, in 30 seconds. Yep. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, we have seen the printing of labels um, of product numbers, uh, product, uh, uh, I mean items. Um, can we can we print um, batch numbers uh, from a, you know? So let's say if there's a purchase order and uh, it's it's an you know, automatic batch number, and at that point I would like to print the batch numbers. Um, can we use this instead of customizing? Uh, you know, a, a report how to print a barcode like an old, old style. I, I guess what you have to do, you can't really use the exact same power app which I just demonstrated because it's based on the release product data entity. But what can you do is uh, you can use standard purchase orders uh, data entity and if it has batch details, you can use it as your data source and expose this information and use it in the label. It's just the mechanism how much or whether you can extract this information from the system. That's right. OK, OK. And we, we still need uh, uh, ZPL uh, coding uh, no? uh, to, to print it. Yes, yes, you'd have to specify. So this is one of the basically that's like a core. Uh, you'd have to design the label somehow. ZPL was the easiest way of um, defining the um, label layout. So you can use any external software like nice label or something like that to build it up and then just copy this over. Right, OK, OK. Yeah, um, so this, yeah. that's right. And just one more question. So. Uh, do we know, you know how uh, how many records can uh, uh, can this print ideally? You no, know, in let's say, is there a limitation in terms of printing the labels? Uh, or? Well, um, from the printing itself, I'd probably say there is no limitation because we are uh, using a standard FNO capabilities with document writing agent. However, I do know that there are some limitations around the API we use, and if you have more than 1,000 calls, you have to pay to this company. Uh, I think it's library API um, uh, for the okay. usage. Yeah. Okay, okay. Good, good. Uh, sorry, one last question and then <laughs> that, that'll be it. Um, so, in, so let's say we printed the label uh, and in terms of scanning uh, the solution, I've seen before, you know, we can use uh, Power Apps, uh, uh, Power App to um, scan, you know, the barcode uh, of items and input the data, right? Um, but how, how we, do you know if, if it is feasible at all, you know, without having to use too much of WMS, um, because uh, you know the iterations involved in uh, you know the label uh, designing and printing using ZPL, ZPL. Um, so to, I'm just trying to explore the options uh, yeah. whether we can uh, you know minimize the effort uh, in, in you know in in, uh, in the label designing and printing. Uh, whereas using Power App, can I achieve? 
physical label printing and scanning uh, you know, uh, in, in a better way or not in a better way, in, in a quicker way? Um, I or, guess or, or do we still? Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, carry on. Any anything else that you wanted to say? I guess, uh, no, yeah, no, I, guess. I was gonna. Okay. I was gonna tell is, or, or is there no other option? Uh, no, no, other than using uh, yeah. uh, the standard WMS, uh, uh, you know, the document layout and uh, uh, yeah. using ZPL. Um, I guess it depends on the complexity. Well, first of all, if when we are talking about just the processes itself, if you want to assess and say, OK, if, if WMS or WHS is really complicated for us and we want to automate some other process, can we use Power Apps? I'd probably say at some stage, yes, you can. If your processes are simple enough, you can build the apps right. that access app as an input and do some. There is actually a good demo from Microsoft on how you can perform counting on the with you with the Power App and it actually gives you ability to scan or so on without advanced warehouse capabilities. Uh, but I guess when right. the process becomes too complicated, like you know, with the advanced warehouse when you have to define the proper locations, depends on some particular product characteristics and so on. This is where it becomes a bit tricky and I would not recommend to do the power app as an option in this case because what <coughs> will happen is you will end up creating your WHS app similar to that Microsoft supplies for us, but like standalone. I'm not saying it's not doable. I'm just saying it will require much more effort than you have uh, from the label for, from the label printing itself. I'd probably say um, you could print it from the app. I'm not sure actually if you can do this uh, maybe like as a batch or so on. It's probably um, uh, closer like have to define the process itself closer on. So you could trigger similar logic like WHS does, saving the label details in Excel and printing this out or something like that. But I guess it is doable. As I said, it's, it depends on how complicated the requirements are. Um, uh, from my side, I'd probably say that uh, uh, with with no, um, you don't have to have a technical background from Power Apps. Like I don't really, I'm not technical person, I'm functional consultant. So I was able to build those Power Apps. However, if you want to have a bit more complicated and reliable solution, you would have to find the person who is a bit more, uh, you know, advanced uh, in that. In uh, yeah. 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 Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Thank you so much, Natalia. Natalia, that's excellent. Uh, uh, what did you do when you um, had a data entity uh, that didn't expose a piece of data that you were after? Um, at the moment, are you just uh, working within the confines of the data entities or do you then, um, how do you maybe bridge that gap? Yeah, so if I don't have it, I will actually ask developer to do it. This is the easiest way, I guess, and it's not really a big modification. I'd probably say sometimes it's mm -hmm. easier to expose an entity rather yep. than um, Correct. trying to, you know, uh, do do find some other tricky ways <laughs> of working this around. Perfect. Um, yep. Yeah. OK, thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Natalia, for your time there. And uh, thank you, um, Jens, for the, the questions that have come through. We'll head on to the, the next presentation. Thank you so, all for your time. So up next, uh, Tristan is going to take us through what they've done at uh, Western Power. All right, thanks for that. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? A little bit quiet, but we can hear you, yes. OK, is that better? All right. I'll switch my phone if I have to, but I'll just talk a bit louder. Yep, that's better. Thank you. All right, good. So, yes, I was approached by ASGs just to present uh, some of the stuff that we've done over the last uh, year or so, um, particularly focusing around our knowledge base um, and some of the portal stuff we've done. Um, I'll show you a slightly different take on Map Tasker. Um, everyone can see my screen right now. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Jolly good. Cool. So, yeah, one of the big things that we've been trying to work on uh, for the last year is really improving some of the customer service elements that we've got. And part of this really is providing knowledge to the agents uh, right at the front. So, um, We've used this in a couple of different ways. So I'll sort of walk you through some of the big ticket items that we've done, and then um, I'll take questions along the way. Uh, I don't have any fancy presentations or anything like that, so it's really just a live demo. 
cross our fingers and hope for the best. So the main thing that we use knowledge for, okay, and this is going to really test it. So this is our unified service test, which is what our agents use. And we've got this um, hooked up with a Booker and Suda product. So that basically is the bridge between our Cisco um, PCCEs solution and Microsoft Dynamics. I'm just going to dial the number. I'm a man, so I can do one thing at once. I'm just placing a phone call and then I'll show you how it starts to kick in. So we have a, or we create a role for a knowledge manager. I think I'll kick something out now. Okay, so the first thing that you can see that's happened here, okay, is that it's found my record um, from the call elements that's come from our Cisco platform. And what actually allows, is allowed to happen now is that um, we pass through the call variables from Cisco and then in all of our knowledge articles we have um, tagged them based on the call types which then automatically presents knowledge articles. So not only can I see that Tristan has rung about a planned outage, we also you know right at the start try to present knowledge art articles to an agent so they can read some information about it and go from there. Um, the other thing that we've done in uh, USD is given them the knowledge base portal. And this is actually uh, now available to all of our staff. I'm just going to hang up the phone call. My headset was freaking out a little bit. So what this actually allows us to do is display what we tell customers across the whole business. Okay. And there's a couple of different things that happen in here. So let's say, for example, now this is live, so I have better go into something that I'm allowed to show. Uh, let me just do oh no. vegetation and do a search. <clears throat> sure, we'll go into we'll go into this one. Could be in trouble for it, but that's fine. Um, so the other thing that we can do, so once they get presented with information, is that if someone in the business notices that something's a bit um, wrong with the content, they can actually suggest a new article. Uh, the other thing that they can do, um, so and what what actually happens, I'll show you where that ends up in two seconds. Um, the other thing they can do is if they find that there isn't a new article, they can actually go and write the article themselves and propose that this article gets um, published and promoted. So what we try to do is give everyone the information, um, have almost this community of knowledge where if there is something wrong with it, to feed it back to the knowledge manager who can then consume and understand that information and then tweak it if they have to. Um, so that way the agents are always getting this constant feed of new and updated information. Okay. So I'm just going to close USD now. Has anyone got any questions about that and how we make that work? No? All right, cool. All right. So the other thing that, um, so in the, in the portal, in the knowledge space as well, what we've also started to do is um, we made the decision really on in our implementation to um, stop allowing customers just to send through um, emails into the call center. They're really unstructured. They're actually, uh, we could handle the vast majority of them just by presenting data in a different way. So what we started to do in our contact us page, so um, directly off the, off the website, if they then start to ask us different questions, um, we start to, to walk them through. Um, I'll just pick metering and then so this is all fed directly out of the knowledge base portal okay so or the knowledge base um, module so there's no development required if the knowledge manager goes oh this thing's really starting to, to bite us we need to 
you know, put some content onto the website. He can effectively create a new knowledge man management article and then put it in front of the customer. So what we try to do is to go, look, read these things, right? You can still get through and, and ask, you know, and put a submission in. Um, you know, can I move my meter? Yes, you can. Speak to an electrician, they can get it done. Don't send through just a, you know, a low value inquiry to us. And then what we do is we go, was well, this helpful? Yes, all right, you're done, right? And what we found is that in the old world with emails, we'd probably get 150 emails a day on average. And now we're getting, you know, somewhere in the proximity of 18 to 25 cases a day. So it's actually stripped out a lot of the, um, the inquiries that we get through. So a central knowledge repository used in many different ways to service both agents and customers. Um, and what we can actually do um, in the knowledge portal itself is we've got some configurations that we do in the knowledge articles themselves, which then allows it to be, um, I don't know, I'll use this one, this one looks fairly safe. Um, what we've actually had to build is just some capability to go, is this showing for the internal portal or is this exposed in the customer portal? So the knowledge manager then just makes the decision whether this is for internal consumption only or for external consumption. Okay. Any questions around the knowledge stuff? Um, I don't want to go too far into it because it's there's some cooler stuff that we can progress on to. But if anyone's got any questions around knowledge management and other ways that we use it internally, um, I'm more than happy to field those questions now if you want. Cool. And the last thing I do before I move on, so um, anytime someone uh, proposes a new article, turns up in our draft articles column, and anytime that someone suggests a change to an article, um, it turns up as a task. So that way the, um, the knowledge manager can just easily accept or reject, um, alter, and then republish the articles again. So it's a, a fairly closed loop. Um, I suppose, in terms of how uh, we manage our knowledge now internally without one person always having to go and craft that new message. All right, so I'll just move out of the, the knowledge space then. And I'll get out of our production environment. <clears throat> so a couple of the other things I wanted to, to walk you through was just around um, our new streetlight reporting capability. So, so one of the things that a customer can do is they can, via our website, they can actually uh, click report a faulty streetlight. And then, so this is sitting in the Microsoft um, portal space. So we've got a whole heap of uh, modals and warnings and stuff like that, uh, which we're currently continue to refine and enhance. Um, we've got click to call capability directly off this as well. Um, but effectively what we've done in here is just given the customers an experience where we actually have a whole heap of data that um, sits inside Esri, so our, that's, which is our internal GIS mapping system. Um, and what this allows a, a customer to do is they can either use their um, GPS based on their location, which is actually pretty accurate, um, and that's based off their device. And then they've got a couple of different options, okay? So they can either, um, you may have noticed on every street light pole there is uh, a, a sticker, which has a number on it. So a customer can, I'm just gonna see if I can wing one of these. A customer can take that number and directly insert it into the map. And then what that'll actually do, just give it two secs. Okay, so we've got this one here on the corner of Monaghan Park. Um, so what the customer has now done is use their, so if they were on their device and they set, and they were standing out the side of it, they could have said, use my location, or if they've got the, uh, the pole ID, um, they can use that to type it in, and then it will find the, the pole for them. 
But what, they, what a customer can now do is select that poll and we now detect whether that poll's been reported yet um, or whether there's nothing outstanding for it. And what we've done um, in the background is once I report that streetlight case, um, it will block the caller or the person trying to report from doing another one. And I'll just see if I can find one that's already got another one in here. This is all our test data, so I think I'm fairly safe. And I'm just going to grab this one here. Another search. Uh, hi, Justin. Yeah, mate. It looks like your screen is stuck, I guess. It's not. It's not loading for me, okay. okay. Yeah, it looks okay. It's fine, yeah. <laughs> Good. Give me a heart attack there, mate. So, yeah, so you can see here I've typed in another one and found this one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this poll. And because there's already an existing case against this thing still open, we basically don't allow the customer to report another one. All right. So one of the things or one of the big problems that we had um, is that customers would continue just to report and report and report and report. So as someone drove down the street, they saw a street light was off and they did the, they did the right thing and they told us about it. Um, but up until uh, two or three weeks ago, um, we would deal with each one of them as if it was a fresh one. And an agent had sort of six or seven different steps to go through and go and check if this one was already in flight. Where what we do now is that we, we do the check up front and go, look, yeah, we know about that one. OK, and we're wanting to take this a little bit further as well to go. If we know that it's a certain type of fault, um, tell them that. But what we what we do off the back of this is that a customer can report up to uh, 10 street lights at a time. And then, so what happens from the back of there is that we then create um, a parent case and then 10 child cases off that or one child case or however many there are that, um, you know, flow through from that report. So for this report, we'll create one instance um, or one parent case. But then what we do is we create a child case for every pick ID that, that comes off the back of it. The customer tells us what the problem with it is. But the nice thing that we've done now, okay, is that we've actually fully integrated the back end, okay? So once I fill in all my details and hit submit, this will actually send a case confirmation to me, the reporter. And what I can now do is I can um, stay informed either by email or SMS. So as the case progresses, um, we'll get information. Because the other thing that we've done is that Ellipse is our ERP, so it manages all of our assets, but the, the Ellipse also talks to our fields um, system as well. Um, so Ellipse packages the work based on the location and sends it to the crew. So if someone reports the street light in Calbarry, it'll go to the Geraldton crew, um, so we don't have to worry about any of that. Ellipse does all that stuff. Um, but what happens is if a crew member turns up to uh, a location, uh, I'm just going to see if I can find one. Bear with me two secs. Go to the child case. I'm just going to find one with a delay code. You should have one in here. Oh, here's one here. That's me. Good. <clears throat> so what we do is we create a child case against the, against that thing. But then what we have is a an interface with Ellipse. So from a call center perspective, if the customer rings up, um, one, they will, as you saw earlier, they will already come through if we know their phone number. Um, but we'll also be able to see the status of the work order. Um, but the other thing that happens is that if a field crew attends somewhere, and they can't resolve it, they actually are already putting these delay codes in uh, their field service, which flows through back to Ellipse, and then it rolls back to Dynamics. But what we've done off the back of that is actually we start to trigger um, notifications to the customer. So we go, the street light you reported with that number is you know near this, or you know there's a cable fault or whatever it is. 
um, and we actually need something else, so it's going to take longer than the five days we originally told you. So what we try to do is just to keep the customer up to date sort of as much as possible. And then once it gets closed out, we then send the customer another thing to go, look, um, this is now closed. Um, and we had some really interesting feedback uh, just last week where someone reported a street light. They actually, and it was at, out the front of their house. They sat there and watched the crew fix the street light. And then 15 minutes later, they got an SMS going, the street light's fixed. So that's when you know that, you know, you're sort of on the right track. Um, we're only sort of three or four weeks into it. We do have some things that we want to iron out um, and improve it a little bit. Um, being an agile project, you know, we sort of delivered probably 90% of the value up front. And there's just some finessing now that, that we want to continue to do in this space. Um, but I think it's really exciting. Um, we've also taken already in, you know, the last uh, three or four weeks, you know, almost two and a half thousand cases off the call centre that they no longer have to do just by pushing them into, uh, into Ellipse um, automatically. Has anyone got any questions around this sort of space and the approach we took or, or anything like that? Hey, Tristan, Peter Pontel here, mate. Hey, buddy. Um, it's good to see that uh, the Ellipse interface is going. That's, uh, that must have been uh, a great milestone. Yeah, it's good. So we've only done it for the streetlights bit now. Um, we are working on uh, other bits as well for orders and invoices and stuff like that. Um, so that as the project has sort of evolved, uh, we, we've just been through a massive uh, ellipse upgrade. So that sort of has blocked us for quite a period of time. But this really was the first ellipse integration that we did. Um, and it's been, uh, yeah, very successful, which is good. Yeah, it's looking really good. Really good. Well done. Thanks, mate. All right. If there's no other questions, I'll show you the last um, piece that I want to show you, which was map task. And you've probably seen this from a very different context. Um, hopefully Ravi's on the phone um, and some of the other guys from map task and hopefully you'll be able to see, um, yeah, the bit of the fruition of your, of your hard work. And hopefully we haven't broken anything. Um, <laughs> so one of the, so one of the major challenges that we have um, in Western power is the way that our, our metering system delivers an address to us, um, it's very hard for us to, to do really discrete um, targeting of customers. So what MapTasker allows us to do is to, so let's say, for example, we wanted to do a, a piece of work along, you know, we'll take Kingsley Drive here, for example, right? And I'm not going to go to the point where I show you that because some of the names aren't highly obfuscated. So um, there's only a certain far, like distance I can take this. Um, but I think it's really important that we show you guys. So in the past, you would have seen, you know, how you can search by address. You can do it by region. Um, the thing that we're super excited about is this ability to draw. OK, um, so the, the guys at Ravi and the guys at MapTasker have been um, exceptional just at uh, assisting us with this because um, and he may want to jump in and provide a little bit of technical information here, but we have a very different scenario than a sales scenario, right? Where you go, this sales opportunity sits at this location or this grain silo sits at this location. We sometimes will have many meters that have different customers associated to it at one location. Um, so they've had to come up with a, a slightly different way of being able to, to target that. Because if we go, um, so I'm going to draw now, and then uh, we'll show you how. Now, it's interesting because sometimes it's easy to do this on satellite view um, because we obviously work with um, these houses here and here. So what I'm going to do is just go, I only want to speak to, let me go. So let's say, for example, we're going to put a new cable right up along this part of the road. And we just want to tell these people that look, there's going to be all trucks and all sorts of nonsense in the area. But what we can now do is really quickly, because um, one of the things that we struggle with with Dynamics is to be able to create a really refined marketing list. Um, 
So I'll show you sort of just how we um, achieve that in two seconds. So what you can see here, and this is a beautiful example of what Ravi and the team have been able to do. So there's one location, but we've got two meters hanging off it. Um, and we call them customer products. And that's just the way we were able to join the data model uh, for a many to many situation. And what you can see here is we've now got 25 contacts or accounts um, in that marketing list. Oh, better hide that. Um, so what you can see here now is that, um, I don't know how I can do this without exposing some customer stuff. Um, but effectively what this then allows us to do is from the data list, from this 25 people, we can then create a marketing list and straight away or within, you know, depending on how big your data set is, we can then create um, a marketing list and we call it, you know, Kingsley Drive, you know, poll replacement or whatever we want to call it. But it means then, and we can create it as a dynamic list. So if someone moved out of one property and moved into the next one, um, we would just con consider that location as part of the ongoing uh, marketing uh, piece for that space. So, yeah, so that was sort of um, where I just wanted to take you guys today. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that, um, you know, any questions that you have or um, we do have a couple of other big ticket items that are currently in development um, around how we're using um, Dynamics Portal, um, using it more of a, a website functionality. But yeah, I didn't want to bore you too much, I suppose. Tristan, it's been here. That was um, that was an awesome demo. Thanks for showing that. Um, no real questions from me. Um, but yeah, just appreciate you taking the time for showing us your story with your organisation at Western Power. That's great. Thank you. Cool. My pleasure. Yeah. And when you do, if you do get a website up and running, I'm sure you will. I'm happy to get you back on board and give us a demo. I'm sure it won't be that boring. It's always good to see different um, uh, aspects of use cases with the portal and dynamics and power apps being shown. So that yeah, was oh, good. Cool. Yeah, thank you very much. That's uh, quite exciting. I will pass over to um, Peter now for a couple of updates. Thanks, everybody. Um, just a couple of things very quickly. Um, one is just around the technical enforcement of Teams licensing. Um, that was uh, originally proposed for April, um, was pushed back to July, has now been pushed back to October. Um, so it just gives customers a little bit more time to, um, to sort out their licensing or their solutions um, to comply with that. And the other thing I wanted to remind people about is that next week we have the Microsoft Business Application Summit, which is now uh, a virtual event and is free to attend. Um, obviously, it does fall in the middle of the night for Perth time, but all of the sessions will be recorded and the, um, the session catalogue is, is now up on the website as well. So. Um, I strongly suggest that you uh, you register for that and have a look through the sessions and, and, and pick the ones that you, you want to watch. But I know there's quite a few announcements and things that um, will be revealed at that and, and some more updates of the products getting pushed out. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. So that's all for me. Thank you. I have put the link, by the way, in the chat window as well to the to the to the Biz Apps website. Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, any other questions who would like to raise? All right, in that case, our uh, next uh, event is on the 28th of May. There'll be another uh, Teams event and uh, look out our usual call out there if there's uh, anything that uh, people would like to present, especially some more great stories like what we've just seen from Western Power. Or if there's any uh, ideas of what people would like to see, please um, reach out to the committee. Thanks Stay safe, much. everyone, and have a good month. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys.